Alex Smithson. I was born in Norway, Michigan. I've been living in Great Falls since I was about four years old. Instead of always done some sort of art, either painting or ceramics, but metal art, I started a construction job 17 years ago and they taught me how to weld and from day one I bought my own little welder, started playing around at home and started out doing like keychains and coat racks and just slowly evolved into bigger stuff. I don't really have any artists in my family. My mom wonders where I get my art from. Most of my art doesn't really have any emotional meaning to it, but like the materials I use a lot of times are melted down, recycled into soup cans or furniture. I start with either an idea and look for parts to make it come to life, or I find parts that look like some recycled into soup cans or furniture, you know, lawn stuff, but I like to give it a new life in a sculpture, like old wrenches, keep them. It might not be functional as a wrench anymore, put it in a sculpture and people can still see it. Uh, well, the stuff I get, I get a lot of free parts from automotive shops, like scrap metal and car parts. Parts I use is kind of a matter of availability. Go to garage sales a lot. I think anyone can sculpt anything out of anything. I mean, a kid sculpting something out of clay, that's a sculpture. I think any art is art, whether it's food that someone cooked or picture someone painted, a sculpture they created. And if they put their mind to it, I think anyone can do anything they want to do. It's a matter of time and practice. I like doing something different all the time. It seems to make some people happy from time to time, so that makes me feel happy when my art makes someone smile. I don't make a living as an artist. I work full time in a factory. I do this as a hobby, make very little money, usually just enough to buy more metal. So I don't make much money. All my big sculptures, I donate most of them, so. I don't know if I would like to have to finish a sculpture to pay rent and be stressed out about making art. It's supposed to be relaxing. Like since I was eight years old, I've had depression and anxiety and art really helps me get away from that. Just to release, gets my mind off whatever else is going on in life. So I don't think I'd want to add the stress of having to finish a project to pay rent or I don't think you have to make a living as an artist to be labeled an artist. My name is Bruce Morgan. I live here in Belt, Montana. I'm an artist, sculptor, carved wood. When I was a little kid, I used to love Western movies. We always had on the ranch, we had wagons and horses and we had all that stuff. But I'd want to make a little wagon just to mess around with and they were pretty crude, but they were fun. And then I tried drawing and I can't draw a straight line. So I quit the drawing and started sculpting. And it was easier to sculpt than it was to uh, draw a lot easier. So I would draw a little bit or try to draw what I was going to do and then sculpt it. And then I found it was just easier to just sculpt it. Okay, this is called a double tree here. That's the fact to call it that is there's a single tree where each horse backs into this. And then the tongue goes out here and if you've got two, four, six or eight horses, they still have some of these down there at Yellowstone. I don't know if they use them, but I use them in parades. Westerns, I did a lot of westerns. And in the western, they have to rig up the wagons to turn them over. So when you're riding along and the horses take off and the wagon turns over, that's got to be all rigged out. So I got a really working knowledge of wagons and how they work. And then I started really getting concerned with the horse-drawn vehicles. Kids today don't know what a wagon, they don't know that that's a Yellowstone mud wagon that they haul tourists around in. And uh, I think they need to keep that alive because it's all this stuff's getting lost. All the old, like, well, we don't have the Alamo here, that's in Texas, but places like that that are really historically important, 
they're just tearing them down and putting the car wash in. And I'm afraid people are going to forget about this stuff. And people don't realize that all the most of the people that were killed in the frontier were not killed by Indians. They were killed by horses. Probably a third of the women that got killed got killed hooking up horses or trying to save their kid in the mud. And uh, people don't, they don't talk about it, so nobody really actually... In the old days when you had, when you were in a, like a Conestoga wagons that were pulled by oxen did not come to Montana, Wyoming, North South Dakota, they were pulled by oxen. And if you've got a six up of four up of oxen, you're not going to outrun any Indians unless he's on crutches. So they made them smaller and pulled them with horses. And people don't seem to care. And I think it's important because you got to know where you came from. And not everybody's an artist, but more people and more and more lately are starting to pick up on art and see that it actually means more than just a, a pretty girl or a potted flower or, or a wagon even. The history is ridiculous now. I think they should all learn that and get an understanding of where they came from because you're never going to get any smarter if you don't learn by how you screwed up before, if you don't fail. My name is Jackie Larson Brett. I'm originally from Browning, Montana, Blackfeet Nation. Practicing tradition all of my life, and I didn't know it. It was just a way of life. My grandmother was a bead worker, and she passed away before I was born. But we had uh, a legacy of several of her items within our family and found an attachment to them when I was just a child. And I really wanted to learn the magic that she made. Primarily I focus on old photographs, uh, vintage photographs of my family and some other Blackfeet elders. I work with that and then I've just started exploring a little bit uh, with some texture and some color and everything looking at animals and working with them a little bit. So I view myself as a traditional artist, but elevating and exploring uh, that tradition a little bit more, making it a bit contemporary. My beadwork is something that you would not have seen 50 years ago. I was definitely one of the forerunners uh, in this style of work. I think that traditional art, traditional beadwork, traditional painting was identifiable at that point in time that it belonged to a certain person or to a certain family. I'm going to be doing a two needle flat stitch. Traditionally, Blackfeet people used this style of stitch for just about everything, about 95% of the time. Please keep in mind that we were people that lived within our own communities forever and then within probably about 140 years or so, the reservation system came into play and started adopting different ideas. So this is an ever-evolving art form that has only maybe, for us, for Blackfeet Tribe, only about 140, 145 years of showcasing to the world who we are. We're very unique people. I want to tell you some of what I know, not everything that I know, <laughs> but I want to tell you some of what I know, give you a flavor of what life was like for me because it was so special. And uh, the way that my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents lived was so special. And I want to tell you all about that. My name is Susie Lake, I'm a visual artist, native of New Orleans, currently living in Great Falls, Montana, and my medium is oils on canvas. 
I'm actually um, considered an outsider artist because I don't have formal training in art, but ever since I can literally remember, since I was a baby almost, I was drawing and sketching and finger painting and things like that. And had a great art teacher, Julie Raines, who was amazing and inspiring. And uh, I went on to college and I sort of unfortunately put art on the back burner for a while to get a quote unquote real job. And as you can see, that didn't really fulfill me, so we ended up right back where we should have been the whole time, I think. It actually started because I had um, a medical condition that came up that ended up becoming an invisible illness disability, and so I was sort of forced to stop doing my um, nine to five job. And I was sort of in this position where I didn't know what to do with my time because I couldn't work and I went back to basics, which basics for me was art. I am so much happier, you have no idea. Um, I'm finally doing what I love, I'm doing well at what I love, I'm getting recognition for doing the things that I love. It's so much more rewarding to create things and build things with your hands, which I still consider painting to be building with your hands. And just to see that finished product and, and then to give that to someone, especially in the instance of commissions, when you can paint someone's, a portrait of someone's loved one or even you know a pet or something, a family member. It's just really rewarding. This is Maddie Dog, and this is a commission that I did for my friend Mel. Um, she has a beloved Llewellyn setter named Maddie, and she asked me if I could draw it and paint it for her. And at that time, I had never actually painted a dog before, and so we sort of made a deal where she would just pay costs if I had no deadline and we could just see what happened with it. And it actually turned out to be something that made me very happy, and she really loved it. I'm an aestheticist, so my art does not really have any political or moral uh, motivations behind it. There's no message per se. It's more a sense of beauty and a mood and a feeling that it might evoke. It's all about the color palette. It's all about moving something in you as the viewer. So I want my art to catch the eye, make someone stop, and want to look at it and really dissect it and take it all in. You know, the shock value thing isn't really my thing either. I just want to create something beautiful that makes me feel happy and makes other people feel happy. My name is Tom Dean. I'm from Great Falls, Montana. I'm a wood carver. I have been in sales and marketing primarily throughout my 30 years of career. I used to be a drug rep for Merck Pharmaceutical. August of 05, I left Merck and was unemployed for eight months. So I came into the garage here and uh, my kids were five and eight and they wanted, uh, my son wanted a, wanted a dragonfly. So we went to Home Depot. I had, as far as equipment, tools, was a belt sander and a jigsaw. Cut out, drew out the wings, and drew out the body, and then we nailed the, the wings to the body, and then we painted it. And then that was kind of how it started. I kind of kept coming back into the garage here, trying to make a fish, because I love to fly fish. So I was only doing them in, with, cutting them out with boards, just a single profile of a fish. Cut out my first fish, which is on the wall here. So I had no skills as a carpenter. I still don't today. Time went on, and then I, um, I kept becoming more and more passionate and curious about doing another fish, doing a better fish. And then uh, a friend of mine told me about some um, exotic wood that was sold here. And so I went up to the store and it was a piece of paduk. And paduk comes from, I believe, in India or somewhere in that region. I put a price of $60 on it. A lady, her name is Jan Robitaille, she, was, she bought it for her son-in-law. And that was the most rewarding feeling ever, that you physically made something and someone valued it enough to pay $60 for it. That was a big deal, 
that was a very big deal. So every time I kept finding myself coming back to this workbench and trying to make a better fit. And I went from curiosity to obsessed within a year. I mean, obsessed. Like, I would be out here all the time. I remember calling my father um, that day and saying, hey dad, just wanna let you know I'm gonna pursue this uh, art career full time. And he's like, ooh. I said, what do you mean, ooh? He said, well, Tom, they're pretty good fish, but they're just fish. I'm like, well, that kind of ticks me off. So that was a motivator. I was exhibiting at um, the Western Masters Art Show and Sale. And uh, a, a lady came up to me and she said, you're an absolutely wonderful artist. And that really surprised me. And that really, I've always remembered that. And her name was Enid, was her first name. That made me so proud. I thought, wow, she called me an artist. Because I didn't really feel like an artist. I kind of felt more of a guy going into his garage and trying to make a better fish and a better piece. So it was, a, it was that time in 2009 that really inspired me to, um, to be as good as you can be. Everybody has that ability because I had zero of that. I had no art training. I had no skill in working with woods. I had no skill in working with, with tools. It, it, something inside me, I was obsessed with trying to make something better, and that would be a fish. And that was a real driver for me. It's addicting because you're, you're always a consummate student of what you do. We all never hit our pinnacle, that we're always striving to do better. collaborate a lot on the stories, on the colors. We work as a team, but we're very different in what we do. I'm Ron Ukrainitz. I mostly do wildlife, a lot of historical work. I'm Echo Ukrainitz, and I do batik, a dye and wax resist process. What I like to do, art is, is kind of a personal thing, and um, I like to do wildlife. Uh, I know wildlife, I understand wildlife, and it was explained to me a long time ago, if you choose to do this as a profession, uh, try and paint something that you know and understand. I've, I've worked with grizzly bear habitat studies, so I know a little bit about bears. I've worked as a raptor rehabilitator, so I know about birds, um, landscapes. Uh, those are all pretty much up to interpretation. Um, as an artist, you're given a scene, and if you can interpret that in a, favor a favorable way for yourself, um, then maybe the day is a success, and hopefully somebody shares that view with you down the road. Like I said before, nature is kind of uh, provides us with the opportunity. What we choose to do with that, it depends on us. It becomes personal then. How do we want to interpret that? And uh, realistically, impressionistically, expressionistically. That's up to the individual artist. Uh, I choose to be a little bit more broad. My inspiration, color and light as well, I love to do the face. I love portraits. My favorite time of a batik is where after a couple dye baths on the face, I can hold it up to the light and see the person looking back at me. Do a story for each of my batiks so you get to know who they are. They're usually portraits of historical people around the 1800s or 1900s and I think it's um, a perfect subject matter to add the color and the vibrancy that I like. And it's also you have a chance to tell their story when they're not here. And the stories are as much a part of the art as the art itself. 
I don't do art necessarily to sell. That's a bonus. I like to have people say, well, wow, I've, I've been there. I've seen that spot. Boy, you really captured that. I was at that fort. I was camped on that scene. I didn't know it was historical. Then you've opened up a dialogue and uh, maybe generated some interest in their mind that they will tell somebody, gee, I met this artist who painted this picture. I didn't know it was an historical site. And all of a sudden, we've become a teaching tool. And uh, that, to me, um, that connection is really tough to get any other way but through art. As artists, we can help with those discoveries by going and looking at petroglyphs and pictographs and traveling the trails and, and the, so we can help in that area. And so we become educators.